good to see all of you this morning. Um, last week we launched this new series on how to think right when everything around us is going wrong. And when I made this slide um, about Corinth, and just go ahead and go to the next one, I did not realize when I made this slide uh, how, how close to Corinth uh, a tumble would end up being. I mean, where else do they call a homecoming football game in the middle of the game and send everybody home because there's suspicious activity? Um, there, there were no threats made against the people at the game. Or, I mean, we live in Corinth, my friends. We live in the middle of the, the upheaval, the immorality, the, the, all the crisis of violence and threats of violence and murderers running around after they've been found guilty, all those things just convince me even more that, you know, Paul wrote a letter to us. He wrote a letter to you and me about how do we think right when all this stuff is going on around us? How, how do we think right when everything is going wrong? And last week we, we read this introduction of Paul in this letter, and I want to remind you, it's a, it's a total letter. If Paul knew that we were taking bits and pieces of this letter, he would probably kick me in the seat of the pants and say, what are you thinking, Jim? I wrote a letter, not bits and pieces. Um, because if you haven't, I really would challenge you to listen to a recording of the book of 1 Corinthians in the New Testament. Listen to it from start to finish. It takes about an hour and 11 minutes. I've done it at least twice a week for the last four weeks. I've listened to the whole thing as a letter because Paul wrote it to be read to the people in Corinth like a letter. When he wrote it, there were no chapters and verse delineations. It was just a letter. And we, can, we, we ended the summary of this letter with a reminder, Paul's reminder to us, that God will never give up on you. So never forget that. God is never going to give up on you. So don't forget that. Now Paul, is, Paul picks up in this letter and he says, Okay, I've heard from people that there are divisions in your gathering. That you're divided about certain things. And, and those divisions, he, he you know, outlines pretty clearly. You know, there's some of you that claim to follow Paul. Some that claim to follow Apollos. Some say, well, Peter's my man. And others say, well, I just follow Christ. And Paul warns everybody, he says, you got to be really careful, my friends. you got to be really careful that you don't let these divisions divide. But the reality of it is, we live in a time where there's so much division, and there's so much conflict, and there's so much declaration of, this is who I'm for, and this is who I'm against. And, and unfortunately, in the church, this gathering of, of people who are followers of Jesus... In the church, we have this, this confusion um, of, okay, what, what are we against again? And I have people ask me, and I'm sure you have people ask you, well, okay, um, you know, where does your church stand on? And they ask us about some social issue, something going on in politics, something going on in government, whatever it is. And they, what they really are asking is, exactly, what are you against? And Paul here is admonishing us that we need to be for. We need to be for Christ and Christ alone. So he appeals to us. He asks us to respond positively to this. He says, I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree with one another in what you say, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly united in mind and thought. And some of you are already sitting up straight and say, what? That means we all have to think the same way about everything? No, can we just do a little bit of definitions of terminology here? Um, unity is different than uniformity. And we often get those two words confused. We, we think that if we're going to be united, that means we all have to be uniform. 
But there are people here today with, you know, ISU shirts on and Hawkeye shirts on and UNI shirts on and Chief shirts on. There, there are all kinds of ways that we are, we can all say, hey, we like football. That's being united. Uniformity is if we all came in here and we had on the same jersey. That would be uniformity. You see, in, in the, the larger world, most of the world doesn't think of the kind of football we play as football. They think of soccer, and unity says we all love soccer. Uniformity would be is if we said we only love Manchester United soccer. And if you know anything about soccer at all, you know that Manchester United reigned supreme for decades in the soccer world, and that, you know, that's, that would be something that we could all be uniform on, to say we all love Manchester United soccer. Paul says to us, he says, got to be careful of these things, my friends. The, the divisions can divide, and that's not the way we want to present ourselves to the rest of the unbelieving world. We want to draw people who do not yet follow Jesus into the fold. We want to help them discover that Jesus loves them, that Jesus forgives them, that he gives them purpose and direction for their lives. And we can only do that if we're kind of united. Doesn't mean we're uniform, but you're, we're united. Dietrich Bonhoeffer is one of my uh, favorite authors. Even though I did not agree or do not agree with some of his political moves when, when he was alive during the reign of the Nazis, uh, he wrote so, some marvelous books. And one of them is called Life Together. And it is a book about how the body of Christ should function. And I just want to, I just want to take you with me to Dietrich Bonhoeffer who wrote this. Every human wish and every human dream that is injected into the Christian community is a hindrance to genuine community and must be banished if genuine community is to survive. Let's stop right there. Here, Bonhoeffer is saying, my friends, if, if we took all of our wish dreams and if we went around the room and we all talked about what we wish church would be like, what we wish the body would be like, how we should function, in your opinion, as a, a cohesive household of faith, if we went around, we would have as many opinions and probably more than there are people here. And, and Bonhoeffer is saying, you know, when we start in, infusing and inserting and injecting our wish dreams into the body and say, well, boy, if we don't do this, if we're not like this, if we don't have this hymn, if we're not singing this kind of music, if we're not hearing this kind of message, if we're not having this kind of programming, then I don't, you know, then it's not satisfying me. When we start infusing and injecting our wish dreams, we're in trouble. We're in trouble. Bonhoeffer goes on and says, he who loves his dream of a community is more than the, he who loves his dream of a community, more than the Christian community itself, becomes a destroyer of the latter. Even though his personal intentions may be ever so honest and earnest and sacrificial. You know, we can have all the right motivations and still be wrong, my friends. We can, we can have all the best intentions and still do something that ends up being destructive. And Bonhoeffer and Paul are both warning us, look, you know, when you start putting your wish dreams into the body of Christ, it only causes disruption and division. And I, I want to remind you that that's Satan's job description. In John 10, 10, the apostle quotes Jesus, who says to us, the thief, Satan, comes only to, to steal and kill and destroy. That's his job description. I have come that they might have life and have it to the full, says Jesus. I just want to remind you, I want to remind you, 
But Satan is so subtle and he's so skilled at inserting our wish dreams into the conversation that we get tripped up and we create divisions and we go off on wild tangents and we do things that destroy the body of Christ in the long term. Well, I, I love the fact that our church is, the part, is a part of a group of churches called the Christian Missionary Alliance. I, I like that denomination. I love that denomination. It's the, uh, the tradition that I grew up in. My father was ordained in the Christian Missionary Alliance. I went to a CMA school. I met my wife there. You know, those, those, those things are ingrained deep in me. But I'm also reminded, friends, that there are hundreds of denominations and thousands of churches that are independent or claim to be independent. And the unbelievers in this world, the people who don't know Jesus, the people who have written Jesus off and say, I don't want to have anything to do with them, one of their stumbling blocks is the fact that there are hundreds of denominations and thousands of independent churches. And can't you guys even agree on what you believe about Jesus? And even though we all have our distinctives and we all have our place, it, there's also a huge negative side to all that. And we have to be really, really careful that we don't allow Satan to kill and steal and destroy, even in that kind of an area. And those, those topics are really sensitive. I get it. I get it. And I know because I've heard a lot of your stories, I know that so many of you have come out of churches that had a bad experience. And somebody said something or treated you badly or who, who knows? The, the list is endless of things that have happened in the name of God in, in the fellowship of what should have been believers that are following Jesus. But because of this kind of stuff, because Satan is out to steal and kill and destroy, we find ourselves divided and hurt. And I'm, I'm grateful that you've found a place here. And I, I say to anybody watching online and anybody that hears my voice in this place, we want you to be here. Because guess what? All of us have the same kind of story. Yes, even me as a pastor, I have that same kind of story. And we, we want to be that kind of fellowship, that kind of household of faith. But my friends, we also have to recognize where the destruction comes from. You see, there, there, there is a huge distinction. Again, I, I know I'm the word guy, and you laugh at me sometimes, and that's fine. I, I, I'll laugh with you. But we, we defined unity and uniformity. Well, can we look at another the subject another way, there's a difference between a principle and a preference. A principle is God's word is truth. A principle is Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to God the Father except through him. That's a principle. That's a principle I live on and I stand on. That's foundational truth to following Jesus. A preference is I like the New Living Translation. That's just a preference. Or the King James or the New American Standard or the New International Version or whatever it is. That's just a preference. But we sometimes let preferences divide us even while we're saying that we want to be united together and be together and believe together because if we can't do that, it's going to be really hard to think right when everything around us is going wrong. Because guess what? I can't think right all by myself. And you can't think right about everything by yourself. It takes community. It takes body life. It takes a household. It takes a small group. It takes a life group. It takes a prayer team. Whatever you're a part of, a worship team, a production team. There are all kinds of things that we function as in a small group. It takes, you know, being on the leadership team of this church that we call the Board of Elders. 
where we spend as much time going around the table praying for each other and sharing what's going on in our lives as we do taking care of business. Because guess what? We need that. We need to be doing that in order to make sure that we're not letting the thief steal and kill and destroy in order to know that we're thinking right about this household of faith and providing the correct leadership for us, it, it takes that, that body life. It takes us putting that principle ahead of our preferences. I mean, it would be a whole lot easier and a whole lot quicker. And some of, some of your families would be a whole lot happier if you know, the person on the board of elders got home earlier in the, in the evening. But we need that time. We have to have that time together in order to function so that we can think right when everything is going wrong. We have to understand the difference between a principle and a preference. Another quote from Bonhoeffer, because I love Bonhoeffer on this subject. He says, let him who cannot be alone beware of community. You get this? Let him who doesn't want to be alone beware of being in community all the time and let him who is not in community beware of being alone. Do you know that there's a danger in, on both sides? There's a danger on both sides. And, you know, his people tell me, well, pastor, I can worship God taking a walk in the timber on Sunday mornings. Great. Wonderful. I'm glad you can worship God like that. But don't be alone all the time. And other people will say to me, Pastor, I just find it difficult to even read my Bible or, or listen to praise music or sing songs or even feel like I'm following Jesus unless I'm with a bunch of other believers who also are like that. There are dangers in both areas, my friends. There are dangers on both ends of that spectrum. And we have to be very, very cautious about how we act and how we move and how we talk and what we do. There needs to be that infusion of Holy Spirit-directed discernment and wisdom so that we know and can tell the times when we need to be alone and we, when we need to be together. I, I, I struggle. I struggle with people who say, you know, I'm done with church. I've been hurt so badly by the church. I'll never go to church again. And this happened to me. And when I hear those stories, there are times when I listen to those stories, I said, man, if that happened to me, I probably wouldn't go back to church either. But guess what, my friends? Here is the, here is the principle. This, this gathering of people is the bride of Christ. And we're to be getting the bride ready for the return of the groom. And we do that in community. That happens in community. That's not only me taking care of my sin and my weaknesses and my fault. It's the whole community being together to be prepared for the coming of the groom. Because he's coming. And we need to be ready for him to come. Bonhoeffer finishes this by, by saying in better words than I just described, you know, being alone and being in community both have profound perils and pitfalls. They do. And it's up to us. It's up to us to practice some self-discipline and self-control and self-sacrifice so that we move beyond always wanting to be alone or always wanting to be with people and we find that balance and we live in community knowing that the community that we're a part of, knowing that that life group that we're a part of, that prayer group that we're a part of, whatever it is, knowing that those people will help us determine, you know, Jim, you really need to take some time and go off by yourself and think this whole thing through and then come back and share it with us and let us pray with you about the conclusion. Oh, I know that's not uh, the independent North American uh, assertive way of thinking. But that's how the body of Christ operates. That's how the household of faith functions. So how do we think right when everything around us is going wrong? How do you and I think right 
when all this stuff is happening around us, well, I, I want to remind you that it means that we put principles and unity first, not uniformity and preferences. We put principles and unity first, not our preferences and not a desire for all of us to look and speak and talk and do all the same things. And this is why. This is why, because Christ is crucified and raised to life. Christ is crucified and raised to life. That is our ultimate point of unity, my friends. Every single one of us are brought into the family of God, have a crisis experience of some sort where we address ourselves before the cross of Christ and say, God, I know that you sent your son to die for me. I accept his forgiveness. I respond to his, his grace. I embrace his mercy. And now I ask you to fill me with your spirit and help me to live as a follower of Jesus. This is the truth that we base all that on. And it seems crazy to the rest of the world. Paul acknowledges that this seems crazy. He says, the cross... The cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. You know, people who are outside of the kingdom of God, people who have not made that decision to name Jesus as the Lord, the King, the Master, Leader, Boss, and Conductor of their lives, those people, they, they don't understand it when we say that I believe in the cross of Christ. I believe that Christ was crucified, that he died, that he rose again. He says, so that's foolishness. But to those of us who are being saved, it is the power of God. And notice, notice his words of action here. And I really appreciate the way the New International Version translates this because it's a be-becoming language. I am saved and I am being saved. And we need to recognize that. We need to recognize that, that following Jesus is a lifelong process. It's not a prayer prayed at a specific time, and then I can go off and do anything I want. Following Jesus is an act of loyalty, and it's planting my fat flag and saying, I'm going to follow Jesus, and we follow hard after him. And Paul recognizes, and we should recognize too, that we are saved and we are being saved, both and, at the same time, always. Because we preach Christ crucified. We preach Christ crucified, and that's a stumbling block to Jews, and, and it sounds like foolishness to the Gentiles. But to those whom God has called, both Jews and Greeks, remember Paul is bridging this gap. Both Jews and Greeks, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. <laughs> I, I almost... I almost want to, you know, paraphrase this, this verse all over again. Because for some of you, you need to hear that, that Christ, Christ crucified, is truth for both Democrats and Republicans, not just Jews and Gentiles, for both independents and libertarians, that Christ is crucified. That Christ is crucified whether you're a Hawkeye fan or a Cyclone fan. Christ is crucified is the truth. That unites us. That's a principle that we're not going to let go of. Because Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. Remember what Jesus says to his disciples? Remember you know, when he says he, that he's going to prepare a place for them to come and be with him. And Thomas speaks up and says, we don't know where you're going. And Jesus says, well, sure you are. You've been with me. You've heard my words. You've lived with me for three years. We've done all these things together. And just so that you understand, because you've seen me, you've also seen God. And I know that's going to give you a brain pain. But that's intentional. Because the Trinity is so holy and sacred and unique 
that we cannot fully grasp the truth of the Trinity. And if you could, you would be God and all the rest of us would be unnecessary. There, there's a principle here that we have to grab hold of and not let go of. Paul goes on and he says, For the foolishness, for the foolishness of God is wiser than human wisdom. Now, is God foolish? No, that's not what Paul is saying. He's using hyperbole. And remember, we've talked about this on a number of occasions. Hyperbole is a, a form of speech that is highly honored in the Middle East. And it's, it's an exaggeration to make a solid point. Paul isn't saying that God is foolish. God is saying to us through Paul that no matter how wise we are, we're still not as wise as God. We cannot be. The foolishness of God is wiser than human wisdom, and the weaknesses of God are stronger than human strength. Now, is God weak? No, he's not weak. Again, he's using this exaggeration to help drive home a point to us. And we, we have to not take that as literally as we sometimes do. We have to understand and act on the, the truth that Christ in me, Christ in me, is the hope of my glory. It's not my wisdom. It's not my strength. It's not what I know about God. It's not my ability to argue or have an apologetic for every little bit of truth. That, it's, the important part is Christ in me. The wisdom of God is in me. I love it when you call me and you ask, Pastor, how do I give an answer to, and you name the person and you name the situation and the, the conflict that has arisen in conversation. You say, how do I respond to that? I'm more than happy to help you find answers and work through those kinds of things. I love it. But I also want to remind you that when it comes to people who want to argue about the reality of God and the work of God, the best thing you can do is tell your story. Because nobody can argue with your story. Your story of your relationship with God, your story of how you encountered God, your story about how you've decided to follow Jesus, your story about how the Holy Spirit leads and works in you, that story, nobody can take away from you. Tell your story, and tell your story over and over and over again. Because when we do that properly, we take away Satan, who is trying so hard to steal and kill and destroy. Because Satan can't take away your story. No one can take away your story. It's yours. And that's why it's so important to be in a life group, a small group, uh, a worship team, a production team, whatever it is. It's so important to be a part of a group of people that help you practice how to tell your story. Because it's, so, it's that important. It's that important for you to tell your story. And we have to be so careful that we don't get divided by our preferences and our desire for uniformity, our hopes and wish dreams for how things ought to be, we have to focus on who Jesus is and what he has done. And when we focus on that, when we embrace that, we become a powerful voice for truth, for the gospel, the good news about Jesus. And more than anything else, that's what Atomo needs. That's what Bloomfield needs. That's what Hedrick needs. That's what Fremont needs. All the communities around us need this message that Jesus is the hope. Jesus is the reason that I have life. Jesus is the reason that my life has purpose. Jesus is the reason. That's all it takes. And when people want to argue and debate with you, tell your story. Just tell your story again. Learn to tell your story in about 52 different ways so that you can do it differently every week if you have to. Because it's your story. So how do we think 
right when everything is going wrong? How do we think right when the world seems to be falling around, falling apart around us? How, how do we think when, when there's so much evil and destruction going on in this world? How, how do we think when, when, you know, when a politician speaks, the first thing we, the first thing we say is they've got to be lying. If they're talking, they're lying. You know, and, and I don't care who, what side of the aisle you sit on. I don't care what kind of political label you, you wear. And I'm not declaring that everybody lies. What I'm declaring is that's what, how our politics have evolved. And that's terrible, my friends. That's horrible and it's destructive. But I want to remind you that, that politics and the economy and movies and tell the writer strike in Hollywood, it, getting that resolved, getting the, the UAW back to work in the, in the auto and truck plants, that's not going to solve anything. That's not going to solve anything. It only resolves a micro bit of all the other things that are going, around, going wrong in the world around us. And we have to act on that. We have to live like that. We have to talk like that. We have to allow our principles and our unity to be first and not insist on uniformity and preferences. That's what we have to do. That's what we're called to do. That's the people that we're called to be. Not, not because we're, we have a label Christian, but because we're a follower of Jesus. I, I'm telling you, my friends, I get so so exasperated when i read my my news feed in the morning i i have stopped watching television news the last few months i it's just too depressing it's too exasperating so you know there are certain uh feeds that you can can put your preferences in and i have feeds that on my screen on my computer screen that i can bring up in the morning that kind of consolidate uh, a bunch of different news sources my favorite one for Africa is BBC World News. And there's more uh, news about Africa on BBC World News than any, any news domestically in the North America. And so I do this, and, and I do that, and part of that is that I, <laughs> I could be very political very quickly. I could... I could let my preferences run away with me and my desire for uniformity, that could just take off like a, a cancer that can't be stopped. But I have to practice some self-control and some self-discipline and some self-sacrifice in my life so that my mind and my heart, my thoughts are conforming to the image of Christ. And that's one of the things I pray every morning is, is God, by the power of your Holy Spirit, I'm going to give you my thoughts. I'm going to give you my life. And I want to make sure that my words today are conforming to the image of Christ. I want to make sure that I'm living with authentic wisdom. Next slide. Authentic wisdom and genuine strength. Because that comes from God. That comes from God. It's not based on my preferences. It's not based on my desire for uniformity. That's a principle. That's what unites me with other followers of Jesus, with you. That's what unites us together. Because authentic wisdom, real wisdom, it's not, it's not all book learning. It's not getting more degrees. It's, it's not going to every seminar that comes along, even though they're really great ones. And I, I would never say don't do that, but don't depend on that for wisdom because authentic wisdom and genuine strength both come from God. Recognize him as that source. Because if we're going to learn to think right in a world where everything is going wrong, we have to recognize where wisdom and strength come from. And we have to be reminded over and over again that we should never give up 
because God never gives up on us. Never give up, because God never gives up on you. Never forget that, my friends. No matter where you are in this journey, no matter where you are on this adventure of following Jesus, no, no matter where you are on this path, no matter how many years that, that you have been following Jesus, never forget that God is not going to give up on you. He doesn't. He wants you and me to follow him, to follow Jesus, and become more and more like Jesus every day. That's our purpose. That's our desire, to be like Jesus. Never forget, never ever forget, that God will never give up on you. I want to pray for you this morning, but specifically, I want you to hear in advance what I'm going to pray. Because I'm going to pray that God would give you eyes to see yourself and the people around you the way he sees you. That you'd be able to do some self-evaluation this morning to know where you are. Are, are you leaning on preferences or principles? Are, are you united with the body of Christ or are you confused and upset because not everybody is uniform? Where do you stand? Where on that scale, if it's a sliding scale, where do you fall? How can we, as followers of Jesus, how can we, as the household of faith, how can we, as the body of Christ, preparing for the return of the groom, how can we live like Jesus lives? And think like Jesus lives. Well, never give up. God will never give up. Never forget that.